Welcome back. One month into the Ukraine-Russia conflict, we saw resilience in the midst of death and devastation. Medical and humanitarian workers are unsung heroes, putting their lives on the line to rescue the sick and the wounded. Earlier, I spoke with Dr. Jarno Habichet. He's the head of the World Health Organization's office in Ukraine. This CGTN exclusive offers a glimpse into the life and work of men and women who do their duty despite bombings and air raids. Dr. Habichet, so good to have you with us. You have been driving, in fact, from one place to another, and you just pulled over for our interview, so we, we can't thank you enough for this. Can you tell us a bit about where you're going and what for? Thank you. And I'm currently in Lviv, uh, but as we have constant bomb raids, so sorry for being a bit late because we had to be in the shelter. And this is our daily life uh, because uh, civilians, but then also the humanitarian workers, safety first, and that's very, very important. Are you saying, but, uh, are you saying you're avoiding shelling and bombing? We need to uh, be in the shelter when there is a bombing. And the, this is when you ask about what the healthcare workers are doing. Now we see the deliveries which are in the basements of the hospitals. We see attacks on health. We know that it's not anymore always safe to be in the ambulance. And when we look to the doctors and nurses, they also are afraid about their life because so many healthcare facilities are under attack. But what we need to do in this space is uh, we need to support, and that's what WHO is doing. We are currently preparing for a um, um, number of convoys. We have already yesterday uh, got the convoys to Kiev, Kiev City, Poltava, Odessa. Yesterday, very important to ensure primary healthcare support that people can treat their diabetes, hypertension. But in the big cities, uh, shelling, most important is the trauma and surgery care that we can provide. So this is uh, WHO's every day's work. Uh, more than 100 metric tons of support that has been delivered with the convoys to the hospitals. And yeah. we have a number of planes landing to Poland with more. Yeah, Dr. Habichad, I'm, I'm a bit interested in your own experience. Uh, you're saying that you have been traveling from one place to another to avoid bombing and shelling. How often do you have to do this on a daily basis? Yesterday, in the area where we are, um, we had four times um, the uh, bomb alert, some other days uh, less, and this is the environment. But um, we need to work, we need to keep our teams safe, and uh, this is the current war situation that is there in Ukraine. But do you have a base to return to at the end of a journey or an ordeal? We, we have our um, uh, offices um, uh, in Ukraine. So we are currently operating um, from western part of Ukraine, but then also we have a lot of our contractors and colleagues who are moving their convoys more to the east. And uh, this is the work uh, around the clock. We have more than 70 colleagues in the country. And then also we have another hub in Poland, particularly a logistic hub. Are they all safe that, given uh, the circumstances? As of today, WHO team is safe. That's great. Um, sir, I want to talk about COVID. Uh, it is a big thing. Only a third of all Ukrainians were fully vaccinated before the start of the war. And we can only imagine how crowded or overcrowded perhaps some shelters can be. So do you have any numbers on whether or not the war has made the COVID situation in Ukraine worse? What we see now is that uh, there is a sporadic testing. Uh, the private laboratories are not testing anymore. The public laboratories are continuously testing. And we have four or five uh, um, thousand cases still COVID every day. And uh, so the picture um, is um, a bit patchy and we don't know all. However, what was important just um, before the first days of the war, uh, uh, Ukraine went through the plateauing of the COVID wave in the middle of February and we started to see the decrease of COVID. And also we need to look to the granularity. If we look Kiev city, in Kiev city, two thirds were vaccinated. If we look to the Eastern part of country, Donetsk, Luhansk, Oblast, there the vaccination coverage was around 20%. What is very important is to protect vulnerable because for the population 80 plus age group, we had vaccination coverage around 20%. So we need to look how to reach out with the vaccination. But the good news is that the COVID also vaccination continues. I was just talking to my colleagues and doctors. The vaccination centers are continuing and there are vaccinations done every day. 
But there have been reports on attacks on those health facilities, intentional or unintentional. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? Uh, we, we, as a WHO, since 2012 World Health Assembly resolution, our role is to do the monitoring and raise awareness on attacks on health. We have more than 40 attacks on health and daily accounting. So we have many of them um, there. And what is important is daily this number is increasing. And we have attacks on health, which includes hospitals, but also the ambulances. Well, that's really unfortunate. Um, and also one more question on COVID prevention, sir. We know some basic prevention measures, right? Mitigation measures, such as wearing a mask, social distancing, uh, you know, taking care of your personal hygiene. Uh, are Ukrainians, especially those in the refugee center or trapped in the war zone in cities, have adequate access to those mitigation measures? Do you know? The pharmacies are open and the mitigation measures are there. Hand washing is important. But I must say that in the wartime, the priorities of the people have changed. Many people are running for their life. We have seen millions of people moving. If we compare Ukraine crisis and population in movement, for example, to Syria, in four weeks, a same number of population are in move as in Syria in four years. We have more than three million Ukrainians moving out of Ukraine. We are number of Ukrainians who have left their home and moving to the western part of Ukraine. So they are doing their best also mitigate COVID, but for many of them, millions, children, women, elderly, they are running for their life in the current circumstances. Yeah, um, also let's talk about refugees. For them, you know, um, who are constantly in a group traveling, it's not just COVID, but other uh, communicable and infectious diseases that they will have to worry about, right? There are many health needs. Some of them are communicable diseases. Um, uh, some of them are non-communicable diseases. Uh, many left their home with one bag and left their medicines behind. So it is quite um, a worrisome situation. Uh, health authorities are uh, putting up the additional health services. WHO's role is to um, bring in emergency medical teams, which we are doing, and 15 of them are already in coordination. And I have met with many of them over the weekend in Lviv. Uh, so that is important that we provide adequate health support to many. There are thousands of volunteering doctors who would like to reach to Ukraine, and the Minister of Health is coordinating also their efforts. So what is important is essential health services to be available to respond exactly to these needs of non-communicable diseases, communicable diseases, provide the care in Ukraine, but also those uh, almost 4 million who have left Ukraine to the neighboring countries. The WHO has warned that the spread of infectious diseases like measles and TB may reach epidemic proportions. What are the WHO and other organizations on the ground doing to reach out for civilians in need? Give us a sense of the challenges, the practical challenges on the ground. The practical challenges uh, and what we do is to, first of all, to provide um, uh, sufficient medicines and reach, uh, share them with the healthcare workers who are working. So health system is still functioning. So what is important that nurses and doctors can do their work. In those areas where there is no heavy shelling, the vaccination programs are still working. So our role is to ensure that they have enough vaccines, enough medicines to, ensure, to provide care. Second is to provide additional medical teams who could arrive to the western part and travel further to the eastern part to provide care. We work with many humanitarian organizations, MSF, others who are already in the field, as well coordinate within UN, as well with ICRC and other colleagues. So this is the practical work we do. So if we ask priorities what WHO has, it's first medical supplies, get them to Ukraine, support. Medicines, trauma kits, surgical kits, that's the first priority. Second is to ensure that there are medical teams who can provide care because healthcare workers have been providing care for the last two years for COVID. Many of them are tired. Many of them don't want to die in the hospital. So we need to bring additional teams in to support the care. And the third very important is that all the humanitarian help is coordinated and kept safe because we need to ensure 
that also the doctors, nurses, truck drivers who are getting all those supplies to the field are also protected. So medical supplies, more medical teams and safety. These are the three priorities that WHO has in the last two weeks. Dr. Habichet, you have been on the ground in Ukraine for quite a while. Uh, from a personal perspective, what is your uh, biggest challenge when delivering you know, to those in need uh, what they need uh, from a public health perspective? I, I have been in uh, Ukraine almost three and a half years, and it is devastating to see what is happening. This was a country with the fastest health reforms, moving forward, health financing, building institutions, has tackled the previous measles outbreak in 2018, moving forward and responding to COVID. So in the current environment, um, we just solve problems every morning and until the evening. So uh, we are really in the response mode and uh, it is great uh, to be here uh, along with Ukrainians support. And I'm using all my previous knowledge and contacts in this country that WHO team, but also many partners can be effective. Are you concerned or upset that uh, there's no end in sight when it comes to a peaceful negotiation for you know, halting the conflict or ceasefire? Are you concerned that the, if this drags on, uh, there could be more challenges for public health professionals such as yourself? I'm concerned and I'm sad uh, as this war is dragging on. Uh, and I see that every day the needs are increasing. So every additional day, of the war is increasing the needs. And that's why the PC is important. But as a public health professional, we need to save the people. We need to support them. So um, we do today what needs to be done. We get ready for tomorrow. And if it lasts for longer periods, we just need to respond. And uh, that's our duty. That's how, why we give, give the Hippocratic Oath. And that's why we keep our team moving forward. Right. Back to the issue of medical facilities, the importance of them. The WHO said last week that health uh, facilities and medical supplies are being targeted and that it is against international humanitarian law uh, with unrelenting fighting and shelling regarding the protection of healthcare facilities. What will be your message to those fighting in this war? We need to keep health facilities um, free of shelling and safe that the doctors and nurses can provide care and that the patients can seek uh, uh, the care and have access to care. So attacks on health are unacceptable. Also, let's talk about humanitarian corridors and the importance of those corridors. Ukraine's Deputy Prime Minister said that as of March 19th, 10 humanitarian corridors had been agreed upon. On Sunday, she announced that seven new corridors would open to enable civilians to leave and also uh, for public health professionals. Um, what's your assessment on the ground? Are they safe enough for refugees and also for public health professionals? Some of the corridors uh, have been used. At the same time, WHO is also um, 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 ensuring that uh, together with other UN agencies and with the interagency support, we are getting the convoys to the cities. Um, a few days ago uh, to Sumi, Currently, other convoys are in making, but um, and this deconfliction and ensuring a safe passage for civilians and goods, and not only medical, we need food, we need shelter, uh, support to shelter, blankets, water. There are so many needs. So we have discussed today about medical needs, but these are only one. So the convoys which are going to different cities which are under siege, are including various goods, including the medical ones. According to the United Nations Population Fund, more than 80,000 Ukrainian mothers are expected to give birth over the next three months. That's about 1,000 deliveries per week. Uh, how to ensure prenatal and also postnatal care in war zones and in refugee camp camps? There is need to establish the new camps and, and, and the services, I mean, new services in those camps. There is need to uh, reprofile some of the hospitals where people are. And uh, in my discussion over the days with the Minister of Health, they are doing that as well. So a lot of the reprofiling and additional services um, are established in the western part of the country. But what we have seen also, healthcare workers sometimes need to ensure the birth in the shelter, in the basement to make that happen. 
So um, it's big number and we need to ensure that every Ukrainian um, is actually uh, delivered in safe environment. But as the war goes on, uh, it becomes very complicated. Finally, Dr. Habichet, any final thoughts uh, you want to share with our audience from around the world watching CTTN? Thank you for those who are um, um, supporting Ukraine. Um, um, thank you those humanitarian uh, organizations and others who are um, uh, on the ground. And I like to thank all Ukrainian doctors, nurses, healthcare workers who have been working hard through all the COVID outbreak and uh, now uh, trying to do their best in the war environment in Ukraine. And every day this war continues, the situation becomes more complex. And thank you for reaching out to WHO in the field. Dr. Jarno Habichet, head of WHO country office in Ukraine, please travel safe, uh, do take care, be well. I uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Take care there. Now, these humanitarian workers keep on providing a ray of hope for the refugees, as well as for the sick and the wounded. Kudos to their work. We're reminded once again that there are no winners but losers in wars, and this one makes no exception.